Welcome, everyone. We will begin the webinar on defect removal. The training will earn you one ICAR credit for non-structural. I'm Melissa Joles with RDA Impact, Dennis Beardsley, North American Training Manager, and Kevin Cregan, National Accounts for St. Cobain, are your presenters today. The presentation will take approximately 40, 45 minutes. And at the end of the presentation, we'll send you a test, which you will need to complete and email back to Dennis with your ICAR information. We will include instructions. We are recording the presentation and we'll post it on our YouTube channel. If you have questions during the webinar, you can type them in the bottom at the chat box at the right of the screen and they will be answered during the presentation. Now I'll turn it over to Kevin. All right, thank you, Melissa. Um, Melissa cut out a, a little bit when she was describing the, uh, the course. Uh, today we're going to be working on defect removal and finishing. Um, and uh, as Melissa mentioned, uh, you will receive one uh, credit for uh, non-structural uh, applications under the PDP program with ICAR <clears throat> for uh, completing the, the test after, after the curriculum. And, and following the protocol for submitting your uh, request for credit. Um, I'm Kevin Cregan. I'm working out of my home office today. Uh, it is, uh, I have been over the past three to four months. Uh, Dennis Beardsley uh, is uh, in our North American Training Center in uh, Waterbleet uh, slash Troy, New York. And uh, today, uh, we're going to be talking to you a little bit about uh, defect removal, as uh, I've already mentioned. This is the second of two uh, ICAR credit uh, virtual classes that we're, we've conducted through RDA. Uh, there will be another module in uh, the month of August uh, that will deal with the aerosol and the aerosol applications, um, all the neat things that you can spray, and uh, from corrosion protection to um, to coatings, so uh, you won't want to miss that one either. Okay, um, a few words about uh, uh, the RSG group. Uh, for those of you who are, are not aware, um, the Refinish Solution Group includes uh, best of class uh, products in uh, a number of categories, uh, of course, Norton, Carborundum, uh, Frecla, uh, is a, a new offering, uh, Solar Guard, American Tape, Defilbus, Fuser Repair Adhesives, as well as Hutchins Tool. Hutchins um, just uh, joined the uh, RSG family of brands last November, and uh, Frecla uh, joined uh, approximately at that same time. Today's class is defect removal and uh, finishing. It is uh, St. Cobain. Um, classwork 0003. Uh, it will be necessary to cover a little bit of paperwork here. Uh, full disclosure, uh, it is the policy of St. Cobain Abrasives to fully disclose to all participants in the course that St. Cobain Abrasives is the provider of the curriculum used in this course. Refinish Solutions Group is an initiative of St. Cobain Abrasives and we sell the products that are taught and used in this course. Uh, and I trust um, uh, we're not all gathered in one spot, but if we were, there would be no discussion on pricing, labor times, uh, who does uh, good work or bad work, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, in general, no discussion on how a body shop or collision repair uh, company conducts its business. Um, you may or may not know that St. Goban is an ICAR sustaining partner. Um, the ICAR sustaining partner uh, program is uh, the latest, um, I guess, uh, evolution for ICAR. Uh, for a number of years, uh, there was a, 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 a vendor or a industry organization called the Industry Training Alliance, uh, and it was uh, um, it included many, many uh, best of class um, product manufacturers in the industry, and they were all part of the ICAR Training Alliance. Uh, the latest um, version of this uh, of ICAR's 
uh, cooperation with the collision repair industry and, and training is uh, called the ICAR Sustaining Partner um, Partnership. Uh, as a, a sustaining partner, we support ICAR's vision and mission of delivering the latest repair knowledge and training to every collision repair technician out there. Uh, we believe in doing the right thing for the industry and, and help deliver complete, safe, quality repairs uh, to the ultimate benefit of our friends, families, neighbors, uh, and others, um, other users of collision repair services. Um, uh, St. Coban has been part of the sustaining partner program uh, with ICAR for um, about six to eight months now, uh, actually a little bit longer than that, uh, but uh, we're really glad to be here. Um, as part of the sustaining partner uh, program, or part of the program, uh, we help lower training costs overall and, and encourage shops to continue or increase training to stay current with today's complex individuals, uh, vehicles, excuse me. Um, we also uh, contribute to uh, reducing fees. As a partner, we provide financial support, allow more schools to run programs, uh, develop better trained uh, entry level technicians as a result. And finally, uh, as a partner, we, uh, we provide resources to help ICAR develop and, and deliver the training and services need for safe repairs. Um, a, a very important uh, part of the sustaining partnership program is that there are no fees uh, levied uh, to the shop or to the individual technician uh, for attending uh, our sustaining partner training. Um, that's a, a major shift in the industry, major paradigm shift, if you will. Uh, the, uh, uh, it's always been a, a, a consideration of, of a shop, uh, you know, wondering where those training dollars are, are were going to come from and, and how, uh, uh, you know, in addition to sometimes uh, taking the shop down out of production for a half a day or a day, uh, you know, exactly how you're going to maintain their their certifications and, and how they're going to provide for training. Uh, well, ICAR is uh, in partnering with manufacturers like us has taken those concerns away. And um, uh, it's it's definitely a good change for the better in the industry. Um, uh, we're, we're dedicated to repairing vehicles right. Uh, that's the long and short of it. Uh, train shops are better partners overall. ICAR studies show that Gold class shops outperform non gold class shops in terms of uh, cost to repair metrics and other KPIs. Um, gold class shops also have the knowledge and skills that contribute to complete, safe, and quality repairs. Um, training also can help reduce liability and expenses. Supporting the sustaining partner program allows ICAR to supply the information and the training the industry needs to perform complete, safe, quality repairs. This puts consumers back on the road safely, quicker, better, faster, and reduces a potential liability uh, faced by automakers, insurers, and re repairs. Uh, everyone knows of, uh, about the liability uh, issues in our industry. Um, the, uh, you know, in Texas, uh, about two or three years ago, there was a major watershed verdict, verdict rendered uh, for uh, repairs that were not made according to OEM recommendations. and and none of us wants to be in a, in a position of having that happen to one of our um, shops, let alone um, one of our family members. So uh, we're dedicated to repairing vehicles right. Uh, the information and education that ICAR provides emphasize the importance of using quality parts and services as well as adherence to OEM repair procedures. These steps will result in repairs being completed the first time every time. Um, quality repairs make happy customers and you know in, improve CSI uh, and other metrics associated with uh, customer satisfaction. Uh, ICAR trained shops produce more satisfied customers and industry metrics indicate that uh, satisfied customers are more likely to remain loyal to brands. 
There will be a test at the end of this course. Uh, it's about a 10 question test. If you're paying attention during the presentation, you're gonna pass with flying colors. Uh, passing this test will allow the, a student to receive a certification affirming completion of the course. And um, therefore they will be allowed to apply for ICAR credit. Uh, there will be one hour uh, of ICAR credit um, provided for uh, completing this segment. So let's get right into things, uh, but no uh, no presentation, no training uh, would be complete with, without a reminder about safety. Um, you know, probably six months ago, the, uh, the only people that uh, knew what uh, the acronym PPE stands for might have been people working in, uh, in our business, uh, maybe in the healthcare business, but now it's a, uh, it's a household term. Um, I'd be remiss if I, I didn't emphasize here the very important aspects of, of wearing proper PPE, proper safety equipment. Also want to eliminate sparks and flames, um, common sense, but uh, you might be surprised to, in, in some shops what, what goes on behind closed doors. Um, you want to in, in, you know, eliminate skin contact wherever possible when you're using adhesives or sealants uh, or uh, pretty much anything in, in, in the shop. Uh, they may cause skin irritation. Wear gloves, you know, wear a good glove disposable glove to protect your hands and, and wear those gloves even though you may not ever have had a problem in the past because sensitivities can develop over time. Eye contact, of course, um, immediately you want to flush your eyes with, with water. Most shops have an, an eye wash station very near the eye. Um, if you happen to get any material in your eyes, uh, flush them immediately with water uh, and Let's not forget those safety glasses, which can eliminate uh, the whole use of uh, having to use that eye wash station. And uh, if you do get something in your eye, contact your physician for further follow-up care. Afterwards. Objectives of our course today are defect identification. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about defect identification. We'll talk about different types of defects. Uh, we'll talk about then removing those defects uh, or denibbing. Um, we're going to dig into uh, buffing and finally spend a little bit of time on vehicle cleanup and uh, how important that is uh, to deliver, it is to deliver a, a fully detailed, nice cleaned up vehicle and dare I say now sanitized vehicle to the customer after the repair. Before we get into uh, defect removal and defects in general, a uh, few words about paint defects. You know, uh, uh, paint defects are typically caused by contaminants, airborne contaminants in the shop, throughout the shop. Um, you know, a shop environment can be uh, kind of a, uh, a dusty environment. Uh, grinding, cutting, welding, and in particular sanding uh, can all create dust in, in a shop environment. Uh, dust extraction sanding, you may or may not know this, can help reduce airborne shock particulates by up to 75%. So work smarter, uh, start clean and stay clean. And remember, a clean paint job starts with a clean shop. And a clean shop starts with the Norton Vac Rack. You can contact your local distributor for more information, uh, but uh, the Norton Vac Rack is a great tool to help you start and stay clean. So let's talk a little bit about uh, defect identification. Uh, Dennis, I'm gonna turn things over to you, sir. Excellent. So runs, right? We have different types of, of uh, contaminants. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry about that. <clears throat> a little dry here. Um, you can get out a run as long as you go at it correctly. Now, there's de several different methods, but something to keep, keep, you know, sometimes a run is just too far gone. You're going to have solvent pop on it. Even if you get it flat, you're going to have to re-sand re it uh, and, and re-coat re and, and paint it. But in a lot of cases, you can get it out. The key 
sharper the paper or coarser the paper, flatter the job. So in that slide right there, where the where you cut through on that run is not on the high spot, right, Kevin? It's actually in the exactly. area around it, right, where it's where it's not as high, and and that's where you get yourself in trouble. But if you come in, and each run can be different, but you come in with the correct grit and go at it a little aggressively, cut the the high spot out, then using the grit rules. So for instance, let's say you started on that run on that slide at 800 grit or even 600. Then move to 800 because it's every 200 grit increments, then to 1,000, then from 1,000 to 15, 15 to 2,000, then you can polish it. Now, uh, or you go at the, at the uh, razor blade um, avenue, you can go at it with, you know, there's some different tools out there to go at it. Um, most common is, is with abrasive. And then you move up with our abrasives to, to smooth it out. But again, coarser the paper, flatter the job. When we start with working with body filler, right? You know, when we put it on that first coat, we want to we want to cut it. We start with 320 or 80, right? We start with 80 because it's coarser. And then we move move up from there because the goal is to get it as flat and smooth as possible. The same with an unsightly flow indicator, which is in a run, right? Um, so we just want to go at it and uh, uh, make, have the coarsest paper without hurting the film thickness. Now, let's get into that. Um, I brought a little toy with me today. Kevin, huh? a little film thickness gauge. And we're going to uh, measure uh, uh, before we sand and then after we've sanded and polished and, 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 and measure where our film thickness is because depending on the manufacturer of the coating, they're looking between two and 2.5 mils worth of clear after it's been sanded and polished. So we, we've got to make sure that we go at that defect aggressively, get it smooth, but we don't over sand or over process, right? So that's, that's another key point to, to be aware of, all right? And, and for purposes of this presentation, we have some very obvious slides here. Um, you know, if, if you saw uh, a, a painter that was delivering the kind of results that are evident here in, in this slide of a drip, um, he may or they may not be working altogether that much longer. Uh, so this is going to be, you know, this is really an obvious situation. And, and some of the other ones are, are not quite as... Uh, uh, apparent. Let's go to the next slide, though. Dennis, have you got this? I do now. Ready? So yeah, we have runs, we have dirt, you know, and we have we have orange peel. All right, so the different types of uh, uh, defects that we have. Um, we want to we want to point each one out. Now sometimes. You know, you know, our job is to match that car in the pre-accident condition, right? So if it does have texture, we have to put that back in, right? That's, that's our job. Um, if the, the car didn't come in with dirt, we have to make sure it leaves without dirt, right? So um, identify it, sand it out, polish, and then move on, all right? The same with the run. Run is something that we put in there by accident. We want to avoid it, but it does happen. Um, and, and try to get out of it again what i talked about before coarser the paper flatter the area and then move on i know it takes a second there it is um so grabbing the right grit so that that right grit is going to be key. Most people are going to start with 1500 grit. That's a good starting point. If I need to go coarser with a 1200 or a thousand, then I do that and then move to 1500 and then finishing it with 2000 grit. All right. Um, the reason we want to do that is to make the polishing process as, as easy as possible. All right. Go ahead. Next one.
Okay, here's your live demo, Dennis. Awesome. Let's do it. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first talk through what I'm doing. I, I got a I got my hood right here. I'm going to talk through what I got. So something I learned a few years ago is I like to mark out my defects with a waterboard water based uh, marker like this. This helps me identify, hey, that's where it is and I didn't miss it. Because you know what, Kevin, it is the worst. Get in the car, sanded, polished, done up, clean, detailed, and then choose, you know, quality control it. And oh man, I missed the dirt nib. That's the worst. I gotta do it again. You know, that's a classic example of over over processing, right? We don't want to do that. So I got a couple nibs here. You know what the you know what the for a guy that doesn't paint that much anymore, it's not too dirty. I like it. All right. Um, so now I, I, I got I got some choices to make. Do I start with 1500 grit? Is the defect super sharp? Do I grab a thousand grit? Don't know. Got to make that determination. I'm going to make that right here. The 1500 I think can get these two. Another choice that I have, Kevin, is I can grab three inch paper. Three inch paper. Why do you think I'd want to grab that? I'm just going to go out on a limb and say spot repair. Spot, spot repair. You know, yeah, I is, want to. I think, I think it's getting re more and more popular um, in the industry. How'd I do? Nailed it. Nailed it, right? The three inch here. I don't. I only have to buff this area versus this area, right? So um, I don't want to overprocess the unit. So depends on what I'm working with, right? If uh, and then I have a I have a secret weapon right here. This right here is 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 one of those cool learning things that a lot of folks don't don't know. But I hope to uh, share that with them during this training here. This two thousand grit, Kevin. No kidding. It's going to be used wet. It's going to cut like a 1200, finish like 2000 grit. One step and you're out of it. Does that sound interesting? You got my attention. There you go. So I'll, I'll tease you with that first. Um, I'm going to grab, I'm going to do one with a six inch uh, DA. And I'm going to talk about the correct orbital sander. I call that DA, but it's really an orbital sander, right? So grabbing the correct tool. This is a Hutchins, and this is a 330 seconds right here. Oh, there we go. 330 seconds throw. That's what I want to use 400 grit and finer, Kevin. All right. 400 grit or finer. I want to use a 330 second throw which means the throw of the, 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 the pad, right? So as you can see here, let's see if I can get in the camera, right? As it rotates around, okay, there you go. All right, that's gonna be a bigger throw. So I have my 330 seconds, which is blue. I have my 316, which is red. And then I have my 516, which is black, all right? So I'm gonna grab my 330 seconds, because that's the rule. Uh, the 316th is gonna be 400 and coarser. And I'm gonna show you what a six inch, six inch 1500 grit looks like. So right here, you can see the defect that I've identified. I'm gonna try to zoom that in. Actually, when I do that, Kevin, I'm gonna mute, because it's gonna be super loud. So I'm gonna mute it right now. That sounds good. Uh, I think we've all heard of DA before. Um, so what Dennis is doing is just basically sanding first step uh, that defect that he's identified. And uh, you won't see every painter identifying defects uh, that need to be uh, worked out with a uh, with a marker, but uh, some do, especially in tough colors. And uh, it can definitely save a lot of time. 
So something I'm going to do here on my second one, my second pass with a three inch, Kevin, is I'm going to measure where I'm going to sand. So where I'm going to sand says 7.4 mils. Okay. I'm going to write that down because I'll forget that happens at age, right? All right. So 7.4. Okay, now I'm gonna grab my three inch right here. All right, again, once I go to sand it, I'm going to mute. So I'm gonna mute it right now. Three, two, one. So Dennis said a, a paint thickness gauge there. Um, most every shop has one. I don't know that every shop uses one for every job. Um, the painter develops experience with the coatings that they're using. Uh, they'll know intuitively how much base, how much clear, uh, and the millage associated with that goes on there. So you're probably not going to see a guy pull out a, um, a paint um, thickness meter uh, metering device, uh, you know, in the shop too frequently anyway. And it's, uh, it's, it's simply a tool, but, you know, when you're working with uh, a single line of coatings and, uh, and you're used to a production environment, a painter intuitively knows uh, the kind of millage he's laying down. Are you back with us, Dennis? Yes, sorry about that. I, I, I measured uh, 7.3, uh, so I took a tenth off. But if it was more aggressive of a, uh, excuse me, if, if it was a higher nib and I kept going with the 1500 grit, I would have to uh, use something coarser, right? Because I'd end up, Kevin, I'd end up burning a hole right through here and not where the nib is. So I, I got lucky on this one, right? Uh, we chose the right grit, it sanded it off, but if it immediately showed that it did not, and you could see a little hump there, I gotta grab a, a more aggressive sandpaper uh, and then move up from there. So the next thing we wanna do, uh, what I wanted to do is, is show you that, uh, so that's with 1500 grit dry. Now I'm going to I'm going to change it up a little bit. All right? I'm going to grab our 3 inch wet and it said it cuts like cuts 12 cuts like 1200 finishes right? Finishes like 2000. So let's go right in the center. I have a 6. Point, what is that? 6.5, right? 6.5. So let me write that note down. 6.5 right there. Give it a little spritz of water. Throw it on the floor, Kevin. There we go. You can see how nice and quiet those Hutchins sanders really are. Oh. Sorry, I forgot the mute, guys. Sorry about that. That's all right. That's all right. To, I'm not that used to doing that. A good example. It was, and that, that's a little tougher to see, but you can see it. That is gone, folks. So, uh, very short amount of time on it. That is good to go. Over here, I'm going to have to grab 2,000 grit right here. I'm using some water and I'm going to make four passes on this area, four passes. All right. So let's, uh, this time I'll mute. All right. And when we go ahead and do this, right, the reason we make four passes is to make sure that 1500 grit scratch is totally gone. All right. A lot of times what happens in a shop condition is we go we go a half a pass over top of it and then we end up spending more time polishing which is you know not helping the production of the of the shot 
right? So what we want to do, take this right here. I won't forget the mute. I just want to show you. Get a nice wet there. Right here. And I'm going to go ahead and mute. Go ahead, Kevin. So um, it's important to understand that uh, shops are going to use probably one or more of these techniques, wet and or dry. Um, it's been uh, coming to our attention over the last couple of years that more shops are electing to go to a dry technique and uh, uh, avoid the wet sanding and the, and, the, and the mess that can sometimes associate is associated with wet sanding. So we're showing you a couple different techniques here. Uh, you may or shop may only encounter or, or embrace one of them in their SOP. Uh, but uh, we have the, the material, we have the products uh, that uh, can handle either application. So right there, you know, I'm still at, I'm still at seven three, so we're, we're, we're still good. All right. So now, right, once we've refined that scratch, all right, we need to, we need to polish, right? Um, we have our polish right here, or excuse me, our compound, uh, our G three sixty Frecola, and our last step will be our super fast finish. Um, well, let's let's go ahead and uh, cover some of the slides that we have on the next step in the process, yep. which is yeah, absolutely. Um, the uh, denibbing process, the polish preparation. Come on, there it is. So we want to yep. make sure. Um, you know, we want to finish with 2000 grit, um, of course. And we note this right here, refer to the paint manufacturer's recommendation. If they need 2.5 mils of clear, you stay there with 2.5 mils of clear, all right? Um, if they say two, then it's two. And that's why we're measuring here. We want to make sure that we, we take a minimal amount of product off, polish it and send it, send it on its way, all right? Uh, you see, I'm using these towels. These uh, microfiber towels to make sure it's very clean. We don't want any dirt to be polished, or excuse me, uh, scraped along the surface here. Uh, notice that we're using black. Black is the toughest color to to work with, and we want to we want to work with the toughest one, right? So. Hey, Dennis, I have a question. Sure. Um, they're asking, would it be easier to polish if you finish with three thousand wet sand rather than two thousand? Okay. So um, some manufacturers of, bra of abrasives, right, um, will will tote 3,000 grit. So this is not meant to confuse any folks. Our our 2,000 is is equivalent. This right here is equivalent to others 3,000. So it's the same type of scratch. It's just a, a different type of classification that we use. Hope that makes sense, but that's that's the difference. So what we're what we're showing you here, what we're trying to illustrate is basically uh, a two-step process. Um, you know, with that with that sanding of uh, 2,000 grit abrasive, and then moving right up to polish. And uh, I'm I'm pretty sure that you'll see that we're going to get some excellent results here. I know it will be a little bit difficult to, to view through the camera, um, but, um, you know, if uh, uh, if you're interested in learning more, please, please reach out to your Norton sales representative and uh, we can uh, demonstrate the the process in, in your shop or uh, at your customer shop uh, very easily. Back to you, Dennis. No. No, go ahead. We uh, next slide. We've got the area nice and clean. And that's a key point. We want to make sure the pads are very clean too. All right. 
Um, again, 1500 grit sandpaper, dual action sander, 330 seconds, right? The blue one. Um, we want to small, uh, apply a small amount of G3, three, G360 super fast compounds. All right. Right here. And I'm going to show you an example right now. Okay. Can you show us an example of how small a ma amount of material you need, or what are you showing us? Yep, I'm. Sh I'm just going to. I'm going to polish it right now. What do you think of that? And watch right. how quick it comes up. So I'm going to mute. Three, two, one, mute. So what Dennis has not told you because he's uh, on mute is, but he set the RPM uh, of the buffer no greater than uh, 1500. And he's also uh, gonna take some great pains to reduce the amount or minimize the amount of heat that's generated in, in the process. Uh, there he goes, in fact, right on. Um, so the, the surface temp is up to about 100 degrees, 102, I think, uh, which is certainly, um, you know, well with, within the uh, uh, normal range or reasonable range. Uh, you certainly don't want to get it up, uh, you know, in the, the, the mid 150s, 160s, because uh, that clear could start to flow. Yeah, we're, believe it or not now, and that's a great point, that's, when it's really hot, Kevin, like it is now in some of the states, right? It's you're looking for 125 degrees or below. What har what starts to happen is the material starts to cake on here. It starts to stick, it, and then as it gets hotter, because we end up chasing it, it, it we make it worse and worse. So keeping that temperature cool, keeping the polisher moving, to your point, keeping the RPMs down. You know, this came up very, very quickly. And I don't know if you saw Kevin, but you know, it was the same effort on the 2000 grit uh, uh, wet sand three inch versus the 15 and 2000 grit over here. Uh, they came up at the same rate. Uh, and that's the key, right? That's a key, key point is to make sure that um, we, you know, it comes up as quickly as possible and we can get that car uh, out and, and, and move on to the next one, right? It's all about the, it's all about the cycle time. Absolutely. So, what I'm going to do while you while you speak is I'm going to um, get this finished up, and then uh, um, I'll go ahead. I'll go ahead and advance to the polish slide, Dennis. Beautiful. I'll, I'll finish this up, and then uh, we'll move on. And I'll mute, of course. Kevin, how much compound is needed while polishing? Not very much. I, I would say about a dime to a nickel's size, you know, with, a, with the area that Dennis is working on, very, very little material. If you're working on the whole side of a car, um, you certainly don't uh, need to uh, over apply the polish. Um, a little goes a long way. Uh, the the Fractal 360 is, just an awesome product. It's got a great abrasive package in it. And uh, uh, you, like I said, a little goes a long way. You, you definitely don't need to waste it. Are you back with us there, Dennis? I am, I dropped the camera, sorry. Oh, all right, no problem. Um, a question and had come in I did, about a question had I did hear the question. Material uh, that we really how much need material to use? Yeah. I actually, I actually used a tick too much on that one. Um, I'll have a better example with my next step. I'll, I'll show it right on the pad and how well it does it. I, uh, There's I got another question. Um, it has to do. With, it says, is it better to put the compound on the panel or on the bus pad? It's a great, that is a great question, all right? If it's, if it's a wall pad, I actually like it. I prefer it on the panel, even though I didn't on that one, trying to change it up. 
on the on the foam pad, which I'm going to show you right now, just a little. I, I put it on the pad. Does it matter? No, it, it doesn't really matter. It's just a it's just that technician preference. What's easier for them is going to be you know that, that that's going to work, right? Whatever whatever works for them is is you know the same with the RPMs too. You know you, we have a range. And, and, you know, we just keep with that range um, to, you know, uh, whatever the technician choice is, right? So, um, so if it's, if it's uh, uh, you know, 1,200 RPMs or 1,500, as long as you don't overheat it, we don't care. Good question. Yeah. So right here, that's how much I have on. And this is our next step with a black foam pad, same material, same compound. We just changed the pad, Kevin. And the pad is going to be a lighter, it's not as aggressive, okay, which will um, refine the scratch on the panel, as you'll see. So I'll, I'll mute it again as I do this, and then you can uh, explain what I'm doing. So we, we've got a, a polished slide up here, which I'll, I'll go ahead and cover that. So. Uh, we've already gone through most of these steps. Uh, Dennis is using a blue pad, but it could certainly be a, a black polishing pad as well. A um, little lower buffer speed, but each technician is going to have his own particular um, comfort zone or a, a hot a sweet spot, if you will, with this buffer. And uh, uh, you definitely want to make sure that uh, you know the the pad is applied flat to the surface and then wipe it clean using uh, some type of a microfiber cloth. Uh, and uh, if you're using a wool pad, of course, make sure you spur them uh, to eliminate clogging. Uh, nothing like uh, dried compound in a wool pad to scratch up your surface. If you're fighting the heat, okay, um, and if you didn't notice, I, I spritzed the panel with this material right here. This is our liquid ice uh, cleanup detail, detailer spray. And I spritzed it, Kevin. And the reason I did that, just to make sure that it didn't dry uh, over top of the panel. This, this looks very good, but I do actually have one more step to your point, which is changing from the black pad to the blue pad. This will allow it to be a finer foam right here. You know, a softer foam, and we're going to use our polish uh, super fast finish G360. And we're going to use just a little bit here. Okay. And I'll mute. So what, what I've noticed um, through my monitor and, and my screen and, and uh, is that, you know, there's there's overhead lighting that obviously in the, in the shop there and the overhead lighting gets sharper and sharper in definition and in clarity uh, as he goes through the polish polishing process uh, to the point where, you know, you can virtually uh, see the uh, uh, the fluorescent tubes or the fluorescent elements in in that lighting. So that's how it's coming up for me. I don't know if if you can see as much on your computer screens or or not, but uh, and I and I know that it can be a little bit of a challenge working with a, a small screen and remotely. But uh, I'm telling you, you've got to you got to see this stuff in action. It's really nice. I got a final of 7.2 mils. Okay, so I shaved off what? Uh, two tenths, maybe? Three tenths. Three tenths I took off. Okay. So. I'd say that's, I'd say that's pretty good for uh, a Two tenths. Versus. Yeah, two tenths. Two tenths off with a, with a good, good size nib. So. You know that's a that's a cool exercise to show, right? Um, the the other thing that I like to share is 
is when you when the heat right here. I actually, when I'm polishing, can feel if it's getting too way too warm, and just be aware of that as the heat rises up. Um, you know, if you're feeling your knuckles start to cook, you know, you really you really want to go a little faster. Um, you know, definitely not do this in direct sunlight, and uh, you know, just be aware of that. You know, I know it's tough this time of year. Um, you know, you may have to change your style to move a little bit faster so you don't heat up that panel. Okay. So I think we've already covered this uh, yep. this slide, this next slide with in in what you're doing there with the blue pad mm -hmm. and uh, and wiping it afterwards with the microfiber. Um, I have one more question. Okay. Please. When do you know when it's time to replace polishing pads? That is a, that's a great one. Um, uh, normally, okay, so if we're talking foam, and I throw them out <laughs> here, this, this one's in good shape, right? This one needs to be um, perhaps hit with air or, or a brush. What normally happens is these things start chunking up you know you start losing chunks out of it it's time it's time to go if it's been dropped melissa then you know and it's it's been on the ground it you know it's a it's, it's foam you know you don't want any dirt in there you have to throw that out so if you take good care of it right it, it's going to take care of you there's not any trash in it it's not you know it's been cycled through you know um you're going to be okay if, if it's fallen on the ground uh, that's that's not going to be that's not going to last too long. Now, if we're talking wool, right? The if it's been spurred a lot, you you know you can actually see the material going away. It's time. Uh, if you see it, you know, clumped up and you can't get it uh, uh, to revitalize and come back, and it's it's really matted. It's time for a new one. It really depends how you take care of it, though. It really does. I hope that answers the person's question. If it doesn't, please keep asking it, and I'll, I'll, I'll we'll, we'll understand what I'm trying to say. Well, it, you know, on, on that subject, um, in a in a previous uh, career with a, another another organization, um, I can remember that we we actually um, provided to our customers pad washers. Um, you know, the glorified five gallon bucket that you would put your uh, pad and your and your buffer in and and you would spin it with a combination of cleaning uh, material slash water uh, and clean wool pads that way. Foam pads didn't really lend themselves to cleaning as easily that way, um, but uh, I know that wool, wool pads can be cleaned that way. Uh, I think. You know, a, a good rinsing. If if you have a favorite foam pad, it's just got a little bit of uh, uh, a little bit of dried compound accumulated. Uh, give it give it a good rinse and and see how it, see how it looks. If as Dennis said, if it doesn't have a lot of um, pits and missing pieces parts in the foam, it's probably good for another couple miles anyway. Mm -hmm. Something I missed, and I and I apologize um, because I know we're going through this camera. Is I I got this light here. Hopefully that makes it easier. Yeah, a little bit. And you can see how we go through this, how good it looks, right? Um, that definitely is helpful. Helped me anyway. Yeah. But the but the light, the you know the LED lights above us are are a pretty good indicator too. Black being the toughest one, right? You know, black is black is tough. We've only taken two tenths of material off. That's with the sanding and all the, the, the three steps of polishing. And we've got some, you know, we've got a good shine here. Well, let's keep on rolling here, Dennis. Um, we definitely want to take a, a moment or two to review the SOP. Is that slide up yet for you? Absolutely. So, you know, again, you want to remove starting with 1500 grit. All right. Um, you want to make sure that the goal is to return 
to match the factory panel, whatever that is. So if it has texture or less texture, that's what you're looking to, to do. Um, we then, then hit it with 2000 grit foam, making four passes. Okay. Uh, then you want to buff. When you buff, you want to clean the dust off, use the, um, the, our wool pad or foam if you want, um, using the G360 super fast compound. All right. You want to make sure you're at 12 to 1300 RPMs. All right. The second step of that, the 4B, same compound, the super fast compound with a black foam pad. All right. You know, what it does is it takes the wool scratches out and starts refining it. Again, you want to move, uh, you want to run that between 12 and 1300 RPMs. And then lastly, you want to use the blue pad, this sucker right here, with the G360 super fast finish contact. And that's it. If it is starts to get dry, I like to have my trusty liquidized uh, uh, cleanup detailer spray right there to give it a spritz on the panel. Uh, gives it a very nice shine. And we want to make sure that we don't create any swirls. Swirls are um, a lot of times any dried material, dried material compound. Um, we want to make sure we remove that. Uh, I, in, in, Additionally, these products do not have any fillers in them. So if I had a product that had fillers in it, it would mask this right here. So we, I would think that it was correct, and then it gets washed or gets rained on, and it's not correct. So the advantage of not having fillers is you know what you have, right, when it goes out the door. Because there's nothing worse than processing the car, having it look beautiful, and then have it come back. And that's why we go with uh, our compounds don't have any fillers in them. Speaking of uh, getting that car out the door, um, yep. final inspection, very, very, very important. Yes, yeah. Making sure that we remove all tape and paper, of course, sure paint, paint defects are uh, corrected. We're going to wash the vehicle from the top down to Kevin's point before, right, Kevin? Clean and sanitize the vehicle, something that we've never talked about four months prior. Uh, perform final detail and inspection and deliver it, right? Move on to the next one. Ed, if, if, you, if you follow those same procedures, those same basic procedures, um, you're, you know, the customer is going to end up being very satisfied with their vehicle. Uh, you know, that whole vehicle sanitization portion now, um, you don't have to uh, watch very much television to notice that that's already being worked into commercials for uh, uh, the major OEMs. Uh, they're showing, you know, uh, car dealers that are, are sanitizing their vehicle after service or after repair and returning it to the customer in a, a nice, clean, and sanitized condition. So let's wrap it up, Dennis. Absolutely. So you folks are gonna get emailed a test. Um, this will be good for one iCar credit hour. You're gonna submit it back to me. You, make, you need to make sure that um, I get a first and last name, and correct iCar ID number, please email it to Dennis, period, Beardsley, at saint-gobain.com. And I'll get a process within the next two weeks or less. And, and speaking of that process, uh, one thing that has happened as a result of this um, virtual training, the sustaining partnership, is the turnaround from the time the testing is, is completed to the time the credit is passed on to the technician is greatly reduced. It's it's a much smaller window than ever um, in the past. Uh, that might extend for, oh, maybe as much as 
six or eight weeks with papers being shuffled. Um, none of that stuff goes on anymore. So uh, it's, it's a great process now. And, and I encourage you to apply for that credit if it will apply to your particular uh, competency, area of competency. Um, so let us help you. Uh, technical support, uh, it can always be found at 1-866-879-3761. Our customer service line, open, ready, taking your calls, 1-800-456-8444. Uh, and I think without any further ado here, Dennis and I would like to thank you uh, for Absolutely. attending today. Um, I guess we can open the floor up for a moment or two for additional questions. And uh, Melissa, if you have additional questions to come in, let us know. Um, I do have one. Um, how can a sh how can a shop prove they sanitize a car? That's a great question. Uh, I think that it's probably a little bit of a uh, a trust factor in in, in these times. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, not too dissimilar from any other shop operation, for instance, welding. Um, a lot of shops will uh, will do a, a weld test or do weld coupons, and then they'll retain those weld coupons with the repair order. It might not be a bad idea for a shop to take a small video uh, and keep that with the repair order uh, in, you know, for uh, to document just that type of operation. Good idea. I don't see any other questions. I just want to also say that I'll follow up with everybody who's on the call, and I will send them the copy of the test with instructions on where to send it with Dennis's email information and phone number and contact information. So I'll do that as soon as we're done with the presentation. Um, I don't see any other questions. So okay. thank you both, thank, Kevin and Dennis, I really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you all for your interaction today. Great questions uh, and appreciate yeah. the engagement. And, and hope you be all in touch with stay safe and, 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 and be well. Okay, and we'll be in touch with um, upcoming training opportunities. Thank you again. Take care, everyone.